Good morning. Welcome to worship. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, our Easter, and our joy. Amen. Immersed in the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for all that God has done for us. We give you thanks, O God. For in the beginning, your voice thundered over the deep, and water became the essence of life. Adam and Eve beheld Eden's verdant rivers. The ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. Miriam led the dancing as your people passed through the sea into freedom's land in a desert pool. The Ethiopian official entered your boundless baptismal life, saying, Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. At the river, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you open the floodgates of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad hearts, giving all honor and praise to you through the risen Christ, our source of living water, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. If you are able, please stand. Alleluia, the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The children can join me briefly up here. Before you head off, have a seat. Come on up, come on up, come on up. Oh, now the last time I saw most of you, it was Easter Sunday, and you sang a song. And the song started with what word? That's okay. So, so, alleluia, alleluia. And wasn't that the word that we weren't allowed to say? We weren't allowed to say the word alleluia, remember? We buried it. You put it in the box, Remember? You put the word of Alleluia. Some of you even made me little banners of Alleluia. You had written and colored them, and we put them in the box, and we said, we're not going to say this word until Easter. But did you notice that we said it today? A lot. We just sang it in the hymn beautifully. Alleluia, Alleluia. Because now we have to say it all the time. So when your mom and dad say, how are you feeling? Say, Alleluia. Why not? Right? And when Miss Kate says, who knows the answer to my question? What are you going to say? Alleluia. Alleluia. Because we can say alleluia as much as we want. Now, some of you made me a few alleluia banners. Who found yours? Who found yours? Name? My mom and dad. Okay. Well, so you still need to keep looking? Okay. All right. Well, I, I left them up for you to find. But once you find it, you can take it home. Okay? I, don't want to, I didn't want to take them down because I didn't want to move your alleluia if you hadn't found it yet. All right? Okay, join me in prayer. Join me in prayer. Guess what we're going to say in our prayer? Alleluia. Okay, here we go. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this beautiful Sunday and for the chance to say what word, my friends? Alleluia. Keep those, what word? Alleluia is in our heart always, Lord, so that it fills us with joy and be with us always. Watch over us and guide us. Protect us always. And Jesus, we end our prayer today with not amen, but what word? Alleluia. Good job, guys. Head on downstairs. Good job. Well, good morning again. It's good to see all of you. Yes, it is an Alleluia Sunday. Easter is 50 days long. It's not just Easter Sunday, but the season of Easter, being wearing white and having white pyramids and gold and just the beautifulness and Alleluia's that we will be singing, it is 50 days long. I won't test you and ask you what day it ends on. I won't do that. But it's coming. It's coming. So today, flowers are from me, actually, um, because I'm just grateful to have a birthday yesterday. It was beautiful. And you know what? Another, another year of being here with you all, just grateful to God. So flowers are in glory of God for that. Fellowship this morning will be hosted by Susan Foran. It will be downstairs. Some of you may know we had a little bit of a water issue. Uh, some of you had had water issues, so you know what I'm talking about. But it's been cleaned up enough, and everything is good except for that door. I'm sure you noticed when you walked in. Uh, two panes of glass. One pane was broken accidentally by the cleaning crew, but they're coming tomorrow to fix that. Everything will be good at that point. But join us downstairs for fellowship, for coffee and treats, and thank you, Susan, for hosting that. And then next Sunday, our outreach um, committee is actually hosting, and we're going to have pie. I know, you all love pies. So come and have pie next Sunday, too. So this Sunday with Susan, next Sunday with Outreach, and thank you all for hosting. This is our last day for you to fill out the dove. We're doing Letters of Hope. It is a project of our Talking to People team, our strategic, plan, ugh, strategic plan process. You say that a few times fast. But today is our last day. So if you have not yet done your letter of hope.
be sure to get a copy of, of a dove. They're outside the church office. And maybe fill it out at one of the tables downstairs while you're enjoying treats and coffee. April has begun, and our special offering for the month of April is ELCA World Hunger. And this year is the 50th anniversary, the 50th birthday, if you will, of the ELCA World Hunger Program. So we're going to be celebrating that with them. And then also, we're celebrating Earth Day on Sunday, April 21st. So we'll kind of lift up God's creation that Sunday and talk about how we can care for God's creation. And then we're going to do it. We're going to do it, my friends, just like we have done in the past. We're going to maybe change our clothes and get some gear on, and we're going to go to Estabrook Park, and we're going to pick up trash. And I ask that you join us, get appropriate clothing. If you have one of those handy-dandy picker-uppers, you know what I'm talking about? The little thing that you click, 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 and it's got like little tweezers on the end. Oh, come on. I can't be the only one who loves those things. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anyway, if you have that, bring it with you. It, it makes time go by so much faster, and let's do what we can cleaning um, our small part of the world here at Estabrook Park on the 21st. Super Books will meet on April 28th. You all are welcome to join that. And also, I put in the bulletin just very quickly uh, two other things. My Bible study does resume this week Wednesday, which we are going to read the letter of Revelation. We are going to read it, and we're going to kind of read it like it's literature. We're going to just really read it. I'm not going to go over every single word like I normally do. We're just going to read it as a group and talk about it. Look at it as it was written, which is allegorical and as literature. So join us if you haven't yet ever joined in a Bible study with me. And then also there's a small note in your bulletin about if you speak a foreign language and you are willing to speak the foreign language in front of people, on Pentecost Sunday, I'm looking for various voices who do speak foreign languages. I'm looking for a, a whole variety, obviously. So if you do speak a foreign language and you're willing to be a part of our Pentecost Sunday worship service in a small way, please let me know. You can email me. Tiffany. The first reading today is from Acts, the fourth chapter. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The second reading is the first book of John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we had heard, what we had seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he, is, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins 
and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I want to thank Tiffany for her reading and also apologize because I'm going to reread the Acts again. Perhaps you can follow along because after I want to have a hard discussion not on the gospel, but on our Acts reading. So, let's review it. Luke writes, Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the chapter 4 of our book of Acts, and what happened previously in the other chapters is just briefly this. Jesus meets with his disciples and ascends into heaven. Now, I, I cannot say he ascended into heaven without doing this. I'm sorry, I taught Sunday school. He ascended into heaven. And he promised, as he was ascending, that the Holy Spirit would come and guide them. On Pentecost at the temple, all the followers were gathered there, and the Holy Spirit filled the temple with that mighty wind. We'll talk about that in May. And blessed them and filled them and descended upon them. And Peter begins to teach. Peter begins to teaching at, to the Jews and those who are there at the temple for the holiday. He heals a crippled man, just like Jesus was known to do. Almost immediately after that, Peter and John, they're preaching in Jerusalem. They are rounded up, brought before the council, where they give testimony about all that they had seen and all that they had heard. After much discussion, they are released. And Luke tells us that they go back to the followers of Jesus, 
and they speak about the work of the Spirit and the growth of the believers, and it feels with all of this from Luke's writing that absolutely nothing can stop the followers of Christ and their growth. And then we have our reading for this morning about how the whole group was of one heart and one soul, and no one claimed private property, Luke says, and all, all that owned property, it was sold, and it was given all the proceeds to the apostles to give to the needy, and that there was no one in need among them. Now, let's be honest. It would be so easy for me to proclaim that the early church, begun by these first followers, were and was all the same heart and soul, right? That the early church is this ideal that we today, as the church today, that we should lift up, that we should lift up and emulate, right? It would be easy to cast a perfection upon these first early followers to make them saints, but not just saints like we are, but saints with a capital S making that feel like this is the perfection, this is the goal that we should have as the body of Christ, the church on earth in our time. It would be so easy to do that, and it has been done in a variety of ways throughout the church's history and even today. This idolization of those early followers of Jesus, the early church, this idolization which has caused great harm. That's the hard discussion I want to have today. Because today when we who are members of the church, the whole church, we feel less than perfect. We know we are not, right? And we have these ideals and these things set before us. We feel suddenly diminished, inferior, like we're doing something wrong. Now, pastor, you might say, it seems good what they are doing, though, selling their property, giving it all to the poor and those in need, helping the church grow. And I would agree. I would. But Luke idolizes it, too. Luke idolizes it, too, because the very next story, well, first, like I said, he idolizes it because he says that they all have one heart and soul. I mean, you've been in a room in a church. How many of us all agree all the time? Okay? So, pe so, so people believe what Luke is writing. All were perfect. All had this one heart, this one soul. But it really wasn't that way even back then. It was not perfect because, as I said, in the next chapter, the beginning of chapter 5, is a story that we do not read in the church, or at least not in our lectionary, and it is a story of two people, a married couple, who does sell their property, but they held back a little bit of some of the profit, and Luke casts shade on that, and Peter condemns the husband as he brings the money to him and lays it at his feet. Peter condemns them rather harshly, not like Jesus at all, right? And the husband dies. And then a couple hours later, the wife shows up, and Peter says basically the same thing, and she dies. What a scary campfire story for all of us to hear who are worried that we're not giving enough, or doing enough, or not perfect enough. And again, this, this story has been used in the church in a negative way. The truth is that couple was not perfect. They were the very sinners that Jesus came to save, right? And Peter's condemnation of them sounds, as I said, less like Jesus Peter's response was not grace-filled and loving or even teaching. It was just brutal. Not perfect. So our reading, like I said, it doesn't include chapter 5, 
because it only wants us to focus on this wonderful passage and this wonderful reading from chapter 4. But I'm, my friends, I think we need to be honest. Now let me be clear, though, before I begin. I don't mean that I don't believe the good news that we hear and read about in the book of Acts and in the letters that Paul, Peter, and then in this morning, John wrote. I, 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 I believe in the good news, obviously. And I know that the stories that are good and, and, and that we learn from are usually the ones that are like this morning with 1 John, where we honestly say, if we deceive ourselves, then the truth is not in us. That is true. And there's good news in that, because it lets us know that, no, we cannot be perfect. These stories in Acts and in the letters that Paul writes and explains to people over and over who just seem to not get the facts of what it means to be following Christ, these stories actually inspire me. They encourage me because, again, they are not writing this to perfect people who just immediately got it. There was hardship. There was disagreement. They were not all of one heart and mind. And the early church was not perfect in all that it did. The church has had, since its very beginning, ideals, good ideals, concerning Christian living, charity, practices, and more. The church has been a foundation for teaching. It has been a place for the sacraments. It is a place that feeds the hungry and helps the poor. But we know like we saw this morning from Acts, various letters of Paul, that even in the beginning, even those who saw Jesus had a hard time keeping these ideals. The Christian life from the beginning was a struggle. To idolize and make perfect the people who are the first to form this churches, this is a disservice to them to their struggles, their work, and yes, even to us. To believe that the church, and when I say church, I mean the capital C here, is infallible, that its servants, yes, even those who wear the robes, that its servants are infallible, and that all teaching from the church is infallible. This is deeply wrong. And when we believe and preach that the church and its servants and its followers Followers are perfect. We create a situation that is not true and in fact harms those who have been harmed by the church and its people. Do you see where I'm going with this? Do you hear what I'm saying? Because, my friends, we are knee-deep in a society and a culture that knows that the church was never perfect. The church's past of good and bad is available now more than ever before with social media, with documentaries, movies, and more, all of it. Even us Lutherans have to contend with Martin Luther's unfavorable and racist writings about the Jewish people. The ELCA had statements written out about that which surprised quite a few in the pews because they had not read maybe some of those things. It had not been available to them in their youth and, and childhood, but it's out there now. It's out there now. And the forced removal of children from their native cultures and places where they were taken from homes and reschooled and renamed, mostly through the church, work of the church, this has caused generational trauma that will take generations to bring peace to. And my friends, these are just two instances, just two that I thought to highlight where the church and the church's leaders have failed to be Jesus. You, I am sure, know of many more. Some of you, I am sure, have had such failures and abuses which breaks my heart from people wearing robes like mine of your own. These failures 
contrasted to our Acts story today have caused great, great divisions within the church, within families, within societies. So if the church pretends that it is perfect, when it is clearly not, like I said, this causes trauma, trauma and damage. It causes people to leave the faith, doesn't it? It causes people to leave Jesus. And they leave because the place that they thought was going to be safe and good was in fact damaging. First John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We read that personally as individuals, but I think we can say it as a church. But as I said, I think having these conversations, reading the letters of Paul, realizing that people did not all do the way that Luke said, I find it comforting because, as I said, if I, we're honest, it is hard to follow Christ. It is hard to keep the ideals of charity, love, service, forgiveness, grace. It is hard. But that is the good news that we need to proclaim. That being a Christian was always hard always hard but it doesn't mean that we don't try because when the church and its normal everyday people do try to be good and try to do the best that they can when they do that they do do good in the world a lot of good has happened still happens is happening here at Bayshore but we have to be honest. There's a lot of people who are hurting. So the next time someone tells you that they do not believe in churches or in the church or the church, understand them to say that they have seen the church's imperfections and failings and possibly even abuses, and they do not want to be a part of it. And when they say this to you, tell them that you understand. And perhaps even agree. Tell them that at least here, we recognize these issues and that we strive to be better, we strive to do better, serve better, and welcome others as best as we can. Be honest with them and tell them that being a Christian is not our get out of jail free card that it's a way of life that's actually hard to do. And it has always been this way. Tell them that one Christian on their television screen does not speak for all. And give them the peace from Jesus that he gives, one filled with hope, grace, love, forgiveness. My friends, before Jesus ascended, Jesus blessed people. Not a building, not a doctrine, or an organized church body. Jesus blessed people. Jesus loved and helped people. And as followers, we are called to do the same. We're called to bless, love, help. And in that way, yes, we can be of one heart and one soul. But let's never, ever forget, ever, that we are and never will be <laughs> examples of sinlessness and perfection. Never forget, my friends, that. Never forget that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Never forget, my friends. Because once we do forget, we cease to do the very work that Jesus actually wants us to do. Which is bless, love, help. A hard discussion to have, but necessary. In the name of Christ, amen.
If you are able, please stand, and together let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Your church cries out, O God, and you listen. As you drew near to the disciples, draw near to us this day. Breathe on us your Holy Spirit, that our faith is renewed and we witness to your love, God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your creation cries out, O God, and you listen. Nurture trees, crops, wildflowers, and all growing things. Guide farmers, gardeners, arborists, and others who tend the soil and nurture plants into life. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your world cries out, O God, and you listen. Guide police, firefighters, paramedics, and other first responders to work for the well-being of communities and the dignity of every person, that no one may need to live in fear. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your children cry out, O God, and you listen. Hear your people crying out for justice, for an end to racism and other oppression, and for a world where all, all are fed and safe. We pray for all who cry out in suffering or pain, and we pray especially for the, an end of violence and war, especially in Ukraine and Gaza. God of grace, hear our, hear our prayer. Your congregations cry out, O God, and you listen. Renew pastors, deacons, musicians, and other staff, administrators, and volunteers who facilitated Holy Week and Easter worship. Open our hearts to discern where God calls each of us to serve. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Accept our gratitude, O God, for the lives of those who now rest in you, especially Carl Weisner. Grant us your peace amid our fears. God of grace. Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Christ Jesus, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. I do apologize before the prayers I should have shared if you have not heard that Carl Weisner, a member of Bayshore, passed away this past week. Uh, Carl was 98, and his funeral will be tomorrow at 10 a.m. here at Bayshore. Visitation with the whole family is here at 9 a.m. My apologies. May the peace of the risen one be with you always. Please share the peace of Christ with one another.
Let us pray. Risen one, you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Christ Jesus, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. And after he blessed it, he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The risen Christ is made known to us in the breaking of, bre of the bread. Come and eat at God's table.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior strengthen us and keep us in his saving grace. Amen. Let us pray. Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. May the God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Go in peace. Rejoice and be glad. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Thank you.